to order. Uh, this is the regular meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, uh, commissioners, introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Mel Roop. Ted Gamboji. Uh, Ken Maberer. George Lee. Uh, George Sheets, I'm, I'm chair, and we have Kaylee. What's your married name now? I, I know you as, what? Nunez. Nunez, huh? Yes. Yeah, everybody knows you as Kaylee Collison, so welcome today. You're our official keeping us straight, and you can try to keep us on the agenda, too, uh, just so we don't weave too much off of any topic that's, that's on there, which we'll try not to do, and Jim will give me the dirty look if I do that anyway. Uh, Jim uh, Lamerson is our council liaison. He has been for a number of years. And do we have any, I don't think we have any other elected officials in here to announce at this time. Uh, we have, I guess it's one main item on the agenda, but first of all, we have the May 30th meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve those? I so move. And Mr. Chairman, just to acknowledge, there was a minor typo in there that we've already caught, and I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Roop also caught it. So that'll be corrected. It's just a... Oh, okay, in the minutes? In the wrong place. Yeah, okay. Okay, so motion, uh, and we had a second. And second. Yeah, and so that's uh, with the correction that, that uh, t Ted has caught, the minor, or no, Mel, Mel caught that minor correction. So let's all vote on that. Raise your right hand and vote to approve the minutes with change. Okay, thank Aye. you. And today there are two commissioners missing, uh, so we normally have seven, but we still have to have four positive votes to to actually appro approve something. So we can have only have one dissident here today. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, George Worley, I believe you're going to uh, present this project. I am, sir. Thank you. Okay. So this is, um, as you noted, a four-part um, agenda item for you. It involves um, an amendment to the master plan for Granite Dells Estates. It involves um, change to a plat, a preliminary plat. It involves a general plan amendment, and it involves a rezoning. Um, it's not uncommon to have several of those things occur simultaneously when a project comes before you. Um, in this case, it's just one extra step because we often don't have a master plan that we have to amend as part of it. So that will be part of this discussion. Just to give you a general idea of the area in question highlighted in red, uh, just above that is the area of Granite Dells Estates that's already been platted. So those areas are not directly affected by this change. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the various aspects of it, but I'm going to start with the master plan amendment just because it will make more sense, I think, in the long run if we look at those um, step by step. Uh, your actions at the end. That was very disturbing. <laughs> your actions at the end will involve four different actions, whether that's um, um, whatever the order, it really doesn't matter. So this is the original master plan um, or the current master plan for Granite Dells Estates, this was the result of an amendment that occurred a little over a year ago. This, this group uh, <coughs> reviewed um, some changes uh, specifically to this area that was done with their phase two. Um, the proposal now is an amendment to the remainder of these lots. So these are phases three, four, and five. So those areas are being affected by this change. The proposed master plan change does this. So there's what it was, and there's what it's proposed to, to be. You'll notice that one of the things that occurred is um, some roadway realignments and lot sizes have changed. They've shifted downward. They're smaller lots. The total number of lots overall for the development will remain the same. So what's happened is smaller lots and, importantly, a fairly significant piece of the original master plan area, that would be this area, is now left unsubdivided as a tract. Um, that would be available for a future owner, future developer to acquire and develop at some point in the future. 
the zoning and the land use designation in the general plan would remain in place uh, for that or subject to any portions of it that are affected by today's changes. You'll notice that these lots, because they're smaller lots, have a slightly different arrangement. The road layout is slightly more cul-de-sac heavy. If you'll see throughout here, um, that's not atypical of development in suburban areas or rural areas. This is definitely um, more of a suburban development um, than the original proposal. The connectivity between these roadways has changed slightly. You still have loops that connect to this main thoroughfare that will connect to the east-west thoroughfare, but the change in the lot size will increase density uh, for those areas, again, with all of that being left out of the current master plan's development proposals. So that may be developed by the current owner may be sold to another developer and developed independently. I apologize in advance for a messy picture to show you, but uh, we needed to overlay both the general plan, and you have this in your packets, the over overlay the general plan and the zoning designations. Um, yes, sir? Uh, George, on that previous slide, uh, am I to see this one? that it's the same number of lots. The lots in the south, east are smaller, but there's more open space now. Is that also fair to say? It's, it's slightly more open space than the original layout for the areas with lots in them. But you have this fairly large area that is no longer proposed um, for development at all at this stage, that we're not counting as open space towards the remainder of this. Well, so how many homes were scheduled for that, un for that uh, unsubdivided track? I, it's hard to tell because the way they're shifting the lots over, I do not have a count of how <coughs> many are I'll bet Mr. Horton does shifting. when it's his turn. So you have the same number of lots in He's a smaller counting. area. It is, it's relatively smaller lots in a relatively smaller portion of the overall subdivision area. Same density, um, uh, per acre. And those smaller lots, are, uh, how are they compared to uh, Phase 1A? They're significantly larger in most cases than Phase 1A and slightly larger in some of the other areas. So if you, these lots are slightly larger, these lots are quite a bit larger, and as you go westward, the lots get larger and larger. So this is Phase 1A. These are fairly compact um, urban lots. Um, phase two, the lots were slightly larger. Th this phase three, four, and five will have lots that are similar to phase two and grow in size as you go westward towards uh, the Peavine Trail, which <coughs> is the west boundary of the subdivision, and the larger lots that were already platted over here. And those lots are two acre lots. Yes, sir. <coughs> Excuse me, George. While you're on that point, uh, I had a I need a clarification on a couple of things. The figure uh, 1,095 acres says total master plan area. Would you circle, is that everything on this map? It is the entire thing, includes? yes. So the master plan was originally approved by the city council at the time of the annexation and it covers all of the, the area. Including even those even the unsubdivided, proposed unsubdivided, I'm sorry? Including those that are under construction? Yes, oh. they were part of the master plan. Oh, okay. Um, and again, they're, they're shown on <coughs> this master plan map. Okay, the, uh, I guess it's on attachment five. The uh, allowable dwelling units under the current zoning, according to the report, there were two numbers that added up to 1,456, I believe. What area is that for? It was for the entire area. The entire area. And then the figure 1384 proposed that's just for these three phases? That's correct. No, I'm sorry, that's for the entire subdivision. So what it does, again, you have the same number of lots, but you're shifting them out of that eastern portion. Mm -hmm. So that's the full number. I have to answer this. Okay, the, um, that eastern portion you talked about, on um, attachment five, 
there are two numbers there, both say 239 acres. I assume that's just a duplication. The whole thing is 239, right? That's what I believe, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And the green areas uh, between the lots, is that open space that'll be uh, the responsibility of the HOA or what's? I do not the believe they've dedicated any of that specifically as, as city park, so I believe the answer is yes. Each will be come an open space area as part of the subdivision plats for the future phases, for each of those phases. Very similar to what was done in phase two. Um, sorry, let me find that. So in phase two up here, you can see there are green areas. They're part of the subdivision plat as open space. And then some of these areas are actually part of the open space for uh, that portion of phase two. And there's public trails through them that was so built by the city there are, tra we'll talk a little bit about connectivity in a mm -hmm. moment, but there are trails that run through um, the subdivision, uh, some private, some public. There were a um, fairly extensive trail system originally uh, con considered um, during the discussions for the master plan for all of this area to connect the Peavine Trail and potentially to connect further south. Mm -hmm. uh, into the state land piece that exists right. over here. I think, uh, Kevin, haven't you worked with the city parks department, didn't you, on trail possible trail connections to those that new area too? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, come on up. Hmm? yeah, yeah, I guess come up to, to say <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it, if you have him up, you may as well ask some of the other questions as well. Um, I don't have to complete the formal presentation. We can do an interactive. No, no, the, 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 because this is a general plan amendment, this is subject to the 2015 general plan in terms of some of the con <laughs> concepts and goals and things in there, even though they're not, they're not ordinance, but still subject to bouncing off the general plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Is, is yep. it uh, correct to say that um, overall the number of dwelling units with these changes Overall, for the whole project, this results in fewer dwelling units overall than what's on the books now, or that was I believe clear. it results in a little bit fewer, um, about 10 fewer. Yep, Kevin Horton, Line Engineering, at Prescott, Arizona. Um, yes, it, it is a few fewer. What, what we did is we balanced, there's some multifamily um, dwelling proposed as a part of phase 1A that is, uh, it's up in the uh, just northwest of that, the roundabout in there. We're and uh, we tried to balance the multifamily count with the residential to balance out the, so the water allocation didn't have to change. So I think the residential units did decrease by a few. And to answer the question about open space before, although we're developing the 239 acres less, within that much less development, we're providing 62 more acres of open space than we proposed in the entire thousand plus acres before. So that, that undeveloped parcel, we're not in our tabulation, we're showing if that were, we're show, we have 40, 39% open space in what, in the development that's proposed now. Before the entire <coughs> subdivision had, it, we hit right on the 25% open space. So we're at 40% within the area proposed to be developed. And if you were to take the unsubdivided tract and looked at the entire thing, we're still providing 31% open space, assuming the unsite subdivided tract had no open space in it. It, of course, will in the future, depending on what happens with it, but mm -hmm. we're still far exceeding the open space that we did provide before, and that's why we showed it the way we did. Kevin, did you, did you say it was 230 acres, that unsubdivided? It's 200, 239 acres, and there, I, I did a rough count. There were probably about 300 units in there before. That's where the, some of the higher density was So you was shifted before. some of that 300 to, to the, whatever you have, 850 acres, mm -hmm. uh, whatever those, that math works out to be. 857 800 acres, that is what's developed now, proposed to be developed. So what would your, do you have any sense of what your density per acre is now? I could do the math, it's, it's the, uh, It's the 1384 units divided by the 800, 857. Okay. Okay. So I, I could do the math on it. So that's where you got the more open space in that. Well, to answer George's question, um, sorry, uh, Commissioner, Chairman Sheets, um, the, uh, <laughs> the um, open space, we worked up front heavily with the Parks Department because the, 
the theme of this subdivision, th one of the main attractions is the trail system. We have the Peavine Trail there, the Iron King. Connectivity to both of those is a key component of this concept. We work with um, Chris Hosking multiple times meetings and we did iterations and that's kind of where we landed on this cul-de-sac cul concept and not having a lot of, uh, some of these roads don't connect because we're providing, as you can see, those open space tracks and availability for people to enter the trail system through those cul-de-sacs. Uh, there's, a, there's a very large area at the south that uh, we've talked talk to them about, about providing connectivity to the uh, Iron King um, trail in that uh, s nice spire of rocks there. It's really a nice part of the P vine that an Iron King system that hasn't been fully developed with the trails and we were talking about that, but uh, we, a lot of these openings as you see openings between lots, openings in these areas, we work with Chris to make sure that we have a looping trail system. And they're not shown on here um, because they're not, not solidified yet, but uh, we do have a trail concept that we work together with the, the trail, the park department. So hope that answers your question. Mr. Chairman, that's an appropriate question. Uh, both road and trail connectivity are strongly uh, encouraged through our general plan. You mentioned the 2015 general plan. Both of those um, uh, types of connectivity are important to provide both amenities to, to the residents of the subdivision and to provide for safety. Uh, one of the things you noted, and I'm sure in the staff report, uh, planning staff spent some extra time providing you some um, information specifically relating to potential future connectivity between um, these proposed subdivisions and whatever happens with that. And um, you have a series of cul-de-sacs along here that don't actually provide that connectivity directly. We have had some discussions um, uh, specifically with Kevin, I talked to him a little bit this morning even, about that connectivity issue. Uh, there are ways to provide connectivity for future development or provide for connectivity without actually creating a road stub or creating a road. Uh, we've oft often used easements uh, to provide for future road connectivity. Those easements can be converted to right-of-way by um, dedication to the city at, at the time of a final plat, for instance, and that could create a road right-of-way to, to stub to an adjacent parcel to provide for connectivity. One of the things that I think is pretty obvious to most people who've been out here is that at this point, there really is only one way into the subdivision that's practical. Um, you can get through the industrial area uh, to the west of there into the subdivision, but it's really not a primary connector. Um, any connection internally provides more flexibility for the folks who are living here to be able to get out of this neighborhood into this neighborhood, gets you closer to the streets that will eventually take you out of the, the subdivision. Um, I had a couple of questions. I've talked to some of the audience members earlier about future connectivity to the whole thing, um, the overall subdivision and development. Um, at some point in the future, this stub of roadway will extend out and connect with whatever happens in Prescott Valley over here. W well, I, you know, I, when I looked at that and pulled the Prescott Valley maps and things, it looks like the backbone road out of here connects up to old Highway 89A out comes out by the water tower up there Cor and dumps it right back on 89A. And I always had the understanding that you were going to be able to go from the FIP and roundabout all the way over to Glassford Hill Road through this subdivision and through through Jasper and those other neighborhoods on S Santa Fe Loop Road and things like that. But now that doesn't show any connectivity over to PV unless you get back up on 89A, which might have an accident on it. And I thought Simple was trying to have all these two-lane roadway alternatives in case there's an accident or road closure, and it doesn't look like this is really ac accommodating that vehicle mm. connectivity. <coughs> I'm not aware of that. Um, the last I looked at their proposal over here, it showed um, generally where development would occur, but it didn't have any street layout, so it was hard to tell how connectivity would occur. I do know Simpo pushes for alternatives for um, our major arterials, so I would, would be surprised if they aren't trying to push for <coughs> alternative connections that would take um, this roadway, um, that's the old 89 alignment you were talking about, yeah. and, and cut it back to the east further. There's also future potential for connectivity to the west, eventually crossing Granite Creek, 
wash and connecting to 89 at the Phippen Museum, the new roundabout of the Phippen Museum. That's off in the future someday. So we were concerned about this type of internal connectivity because overall that connectivity is a, is a concern. Um, the trails are equally important. I, I think um, the developer has, from the beginning, expressed an <coughs> a desire to have trail connectivity to uh, provide amenities that he doesn't otherwise have up here. Uh, As it was quick comment for sure. the developer. Um, I think the, the curvilinear road layout, I think, does a good job of uh, minimizing the when you look at other subdivisions with parallel roads, gridiron patterns, et cetera, when you've got small lots, the curvilinear road pattern s helps soften the visual impact of a long, straight bunch of homes the same size. I think you've done a good job on that. Thank you. Yeah, the, the intent here is to disturb as little of the land as possible. I, I know it's dense. We are providing more open space. We're really trying to leave the drainage ways natural, not trying to disturb any of that. So we really wanted to, on this layout, follow the topography the best we could. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I think we've touched on many or most of the topics. No, um, I think I do just want to point summarize out the four things that we're possibly okay. going to do today. I'll do, let me touch on one other thing. We, we did receive some uh, comments from the owner of this out parcel. That small white area shown in the middle is uh, property owned by uh, um, Izona Estates LLC, I believe is the, the name of it. Um, they were concerned that any of these changes might affect their property and their connectivity to the road network. Um, that was something that was taken care of during the phase two development. A final plat includes an easement to provide them connectivity. Um, you'll recall, I think that, well, some of you will recall that uh, several years ago they came before you with their own miniature master plan just for their lots in here. They were going to provide something that was um, roughly that density, um, those size lots, in here. Um, I believe there were 20 lots, 18 or 20 lots that they proposed. Um, we resolved their concerns by letting them know that that easement was already created and none of the existing plats are affected by this proposal. So that, that's a, something that should be reassuring and to well uh, the left existing left owners. Well, left of that white box, I believe, is the clubhouse. Is that's that correct. correct, Kevin? That's correct. There's a clubhouse that's got, I don't know what it's got in it, but just, just the, the clubhouse, uh, it's, it's being constructed now and actually close to finalized now, but it's the clubhouse pool, like pickleball courts. So, okay. And, and just just a note about the unsubdivided tracks. I know there is concern about the connectivity there. Um, George, correct me if I misspeak at any point, but there there is no water allocated for the development of that after this proposal, if and when this proposal gets approved. The boundary of Granite Dells Estates is that eastern boundary. So the developer has no water allocation and no ability to develop that without coming before the commission and going through the entire process again. So I, I so just wanted to make that clear. That is correct. So any, any future development of that would require them start from scratch, so to speak, and come back to the city starting with plats. But and we're water. not rezoning that or anything, are we, that undeveloped piece, or are we? We're making an amendment to, well, I mean, it, it, you're just leaving it as open space, well, it, un, it, undeveloped it's lands. undeveloped, yes. Yeah, the, under, the underlying zoning is RE2 and uh, SF35, and I believe there's some George, there's some different zoning up there on the northern corner of it also. So this, this upper area is multifamily zoning, and then you've got two acre and 35 that come down here. So would we be modifying any of that today? Or? None of that, I believe, is included in the or Just leave it as it is until such time as something else Correct. might happen, I guess. So the, the rezoning, the master plan, and the general plan amendments all affect this area. In fact, the general plan amendments primarily over here. Um, there's a large lot um, general plan designation that would work fine with with this size development and this size development, but anything with smaller, so these are two acre lots, these are roughly one acre lots. Anything smaller than that one acre required the general plan to allow for the low to medium density rather than very low, and that's what the designation does. It changes all of this to low to medium. Um, our general plan designations do not line up exactly with the zoning districts, as you're aware. So low to medium covers 
five, six different residential zoning categories um, that won't necessarily be affected by this. Uh, the proposal before you is specific, maybe I'll put it well, uh, specifically uh, the rezoning would reduce the zoning density from two acre and 35 down to SF9. Um, it would change the general land use um, of the, again, area on mostly on the western side from very low density to low to medium density <coughs> designation. Um, you're also looking at a subdivision plat, preliminary plat for the remaining three subdivisions. Um, past experience with Granite Dells Estates is they do a relatively large area of preliminary plat and then final plat in phases. Phase one was done in two or three pieces. Phase two was done in two pieces as final plats. And we would expect the same thing would occur here as infrastructure and roadway is extended. They would do a phase at a time of um, those units, um, three, four, mm -hmm. and five. George uh, or Kevin, I know this is probably pretty elementary for some, but could you show us where the houses are currently built? Are they just in phase one or are they also in phase two? So yeah. fa phase one is yeah. almost at 100% build out if it is not. I mean, it's very close. Fa phase two is under construction. So there, this the infrastructure is built in this area for phase two. Homes are being built. I'm not sure if any are occupied, but that's they're the one that's under construction. Uh, under construction. The, the clubhouse here is almost complete. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then phase one D, um, this the infrastructure is complete in here, and there's one home in there. Well, do you know in, in phase 1A, you have maybe four or five different production type builders in there, and they they, they would take down a certain number of lots, like by 10 here, and mm -hmm. another one would take down a few lots over here. Do you, are they going to keep that same concept where they'll have mul multiple bu builders that you can go pick your own builder and then go in, and whichever lots the builder happens to take down and own, then that, that's what the builder you're going to get if you want a particular lot? Right, right now that's working well, and that, that is the plan I mean, for the foreseeable mm -hmm. future. That's what's happening in phase two, and the, uh, the demand is, is such that they're, he's ready to move forward with this. And in the preliminary plot, we tried to break it down into, into realistic nodes that you can see on there. We have phase 3A, 3B, 3C, and 3D, because just, just like that, it's, it's nice to build it in, in reasonable sized chunks. So you don't get too far ahead of yourself, but the demands there were this is needed at this point. But I think like didn't Dorn bought a whole lot of lots in phase two, didn't they? And because it's kind of like they're jumping in and snapping them up. You know, it's kind of a co competitive who can get to the lots first that are that are ready to go. But there are several builders, and the in the product <coughs> size that we have shown in here meets each of their needs. So um, we tried to do a, a nice mix of different size products that would satisfy each of the builders in the area. It's working well. Yeah. Well, the, I guess they must have some standards because they don't really clash having the different builders in there like you might think and could happen. No, it's, it's working well. And, and just, just an overview of the, whole, the, con the concept here. The, the back in the day when we, s when we did this um, years ago, the original master plan, the vision was that it was going to be larger lots, the people of build custom homes, and that, that just is not... There's, there are, is very little demand for that product anymore. The builders like to have a, a mass graded padded lot that they can build and surprisingly, people don't seem to want the, the larger lots to maintain anymore. So um, the vision of it has changed. We tried to stick with the open vision that we had before of kind of an, of an open trail based community and um, hopefully we've, we've uh, met, met the, uh, the goal. At first, it was going to be equestrian oriented. What, there was going to be an equestrian center and all that, and that just pretty much uh, dried up that concept. There was an equestrian vision early on. Yep. And equestrian centers work great if there are no houses right next door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions for George or Kevin? We'll open it up to the public. Thank you. I was going to point out a number of folks are here. Yeah, yep, no, we want to hear from the public. This is a public hearing. You, but we can vote on this today, too, as I understand. You may vote on this and move it on towards council, yes, sir. Yes, okay. <coughs> okay, state your name and the city you live in. Gary Warab, uh, 
I've been a resident of Prescott uh, for 13 years. Germane to this, and I want to thank Kevin, he cleared up a lot of my concerns. I was on the 2015 general plan. More importantly, I was the chairman for open space and trails. Oh, we had meetings for quite a while. We developed a 10-year plan for trails, which incorporated this as well, and we completed that in six years. Um, a little bit about my background relative to this. I recently wrote a three-quarter million dollar matching grant proposal for open space. We're waiting for that. There's another half million dollar following that. So um, I am a member of the Overhill Gang, and I did help build these trails. And so it's really important to me to hear what I just heard, that this will continue this philosophy of uh, connectivity. And one reason it's important to me is the, I did have a wonderful conversation with Mike Fan, who I really respect, before Shovel went to ground about the importance of trails. And Mike certainly followed up on that, and I, I'm really appreciative of that. We all are. I'm a chairman of the Greater Prescott Outdoors Fund. We are a fund under the Arizona Community Foundation dedicated to uh, outdoor recreation, trails, and uh, things relative to the future of Prescott. And we've been very successful in the few years we've been in incorporated. Um, more importantly, for this project and projects in Prescott, I'm one of the Prescott ambassadors for the Sun Corridor Trail, which a lot of people don't know yet is the Appalachian Trail of the West of the desert. It's a thousand mile trail going from Douglas, Arizona, all the way to Las Vegas, and certainly incorporates Prescott and the Peavine Trail, which is connected to this project. So I did a white paper uh, last year about the importance of trails and development. Uh, number one, it increases property value up to 10%. But that's a national standard. Number two, for every dollar invested in outdoor recreation, there's a $3 return. So the more we contribute to projects like this, the more draw we get from people wanting to move to Prescott who invest here and people coming to hike the trails. Last year, we had uh, approximately a million people come to entertain hiking here, the Peavine, going right past us. So I'm really, really excited about the potential for connectivity to that Peavine and to the Sun Corridor Trail. We will be one of the, we are now one of the top 15 destination places in the United States for trails. So that's important. Um, so my purpose here today, and it's already been fulfilled, I believe, is to question and hope that these new phases will incorporate trails and of course the overhill gang. So I'm really pleased with what I'm hearing and um, I'm certainly not here for objection. So thank you. One second. Yes. <coughs> Earlier, uh, was Kevin? Kevin mentioned there are two trails, the Peavine Trail and there's a- Iron, Iron King Trail? Iron Trail. And you haven't worked out how it goes through the development yet. But George, do you have an idea where touches one end of the development and where it touches the other end? So right along this border, that black line is the boundary of the subdivision. It's also the boundary of the Peavine Trail right-of-way. So the Peavine Trail runs right through here. It goes further south. It goes into the, into the Dells, the, the rocky area of the Dells. The Iron King Trail is south of here, and there is a piece of state land roughly right here, just off the map, that would provide future connectivity to that Iron King Trail. So somewhere along the south edge of the map here would provide an opportunity to make a trail connection headed further south, ultimately to the Iron King Trail. The Iron King Trail runs from the Peavine Trail eastward into Prescott Valley. Yeah, thank you. So uh, one other uh, important thing is, I've been writing grant proposals for 40 years and been in community and economic development we have been very successful here and just recently got, were awarded another grant uh, for connectivity with trails. We will soon, hopefully, with the state approval, connect the Peavine all the way out to Perkinsville Road and then to Jerome and all the way up to Flagstaff. So 
we're on the map and we're really running and we're doing really well. So I want to thank Kevin and Mike Fan and everybody involved for this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Okay, other members of the public. Yeah, come on up. Oh, okay, step up to the microphones because this is uh, on TV live right now as well as it's be recorded. And oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Address. You don't no have pressure. to smile if you know if no you're not. Pressure. You know, no, I live however in, uh, you feel is fine. Yeah. I live in Phase One A right now. Enjoy it. It's a very mm -hmm. beautiful place. I did just wonder if any of these diagrams are available for us to look at, either online or hard copy. Uh, they are, and I can get you hard copies um, as well. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Come on up. State your name and location. My, my name is Mark Shaw. I also live in Phase 1A, and we really enjoy hiking that area right there where it says Phase 1A. has some very nice trails on it, uh, and we go down. Now, Phase 1D is behind a gated community. Is all that green space down there private, open space, or will be open to the public? Um, all, I believe all of it will be designated as part of the subdivisions. Um, Mr. Horton probably can confirm that, but generally speaking, just like in Phase 1A or Phase 1 and Phase 2, there are private open spaces that are assigned to the subdivision for the HOA management of. Right. But, th but to be have trails through there that are built by and maintained by the city, then th that has to be a, a, pub a public system. But, you know, like at Prescott Lakes, 99% of the people that actually hike on all the trails through there, which are all public by the development agreement, the, are, are residents of that community. I, I mean, trails and subdivisions are, aren't normally a destination trail system. It's, you know, it's pretty much a benefit of those that live in it. But by being public, you're protected by there's a state statute on several reasons why declaring them public is, is an advantage, even though you're not really going to be bringing people in very often to... Uh, to just, hike in there. just to clarify, the open space areas can be private. The trails can still be public if that's part of the uh, re the final plat approval. So it's possible. Well, it's to private. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's not owned by the city. Place. There have been subdivisions in town that turn it all over to the city, but the city's not normally wants to solicit ownership of more land if it doesn't doesn't have to. Uh, it's sort of related. So. Phase 1D is behind, I, I assume those are not public uh, city streets that's behind the gate. It looks like Phase 5 is also going to be behind the gate, is that correct? We anticipate several of these will be gated, yes, sir. And one last question. For some, I don't know where they get informa information, but Google Maps wants to take me from Phase 1A to downtown, apparently on the old 89A. Is that going to eventually be reopened, or is hmm. Google Maps get ba got bad information? It, they have bad information. I don't anticipate that being opened. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Kevin, you have something you want to clarify here? Yeah, I'll, I'll clarify. There, the, on the master plan, there's a gated location. The, there currently is a gate here. Phase 1D is private roads. There's a gate proposed here and a gated turnaround proposed here. So the only gated portion of the subdivision proposed now is this area. I believe the previous master plan had a substantial amount more of private roadways. But to answer the gentleman's question, the open space is privately owned and maintained by the homeowners association but is the intent of the developer and us working with the parks and recreation department that the trails would be city trails maintained by the city of prescott so open to the public mm -hmm. okay thank you yep. other members of the public Good morning. Anyway. Yep, state your, yeah. Good morning, sir. My name is Gene Blair. I live in area phase 1A along with my good neighbor to the back back here. And so he gave me a question. He's going to get me in trouble. But uh, <laughs> number one, uh, if you don't mind, please, uh, phase 1A is a very nice area. Uh, is there going to be any development at all on the wording there that says phase 1A? Will there be any future housing? <laughs> No, uh, as you note, the green color up here, the green is intended to be open space areas. Now, they may be drainages or hillsides, something like that, but not proposed for development. Okay. To the north of Phase 1A there, there's two tan areas. 
we assume that those are to be commercial. They could be commercial or multifamily. I believe Mr. Horton mentioned a multifamily development potential for uh, that area. So it could be an apartments or condominium type of, of use. So my pizza plan is out of the question then, right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, two access roads are normally required, I believe, through the state for ingress and egress for the fire departments. We don't really see that right now. So the future growth for the old 89A will have to be accomplished to get people in and out of there. So again, this is still and will remain the primary access into the subdivision. Right. At some point, this roadway will connect to something over here, okay. either 89A or uh, streets in the Prescott Valley development called Jasper. Okay. And eventually, this roadway will connect all the way across to the Pippin Museum. So right. this okay. one would eventually provide that connectivity. Okay. Okay. Very good. You're doing great. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, the uh, the common areas. Uh, for uh, trails, trail uses, will those be maintained at a cost to the homeowners or will that be a cost that would be covered by the Okay, the well the city ha works with uh, the county juvenile probation and the, the adult probation and the, and the over the hell gang, so depending on what needs to be done, it's currently being done by all volunteers, but of course, like trails and landscaping kind of flow together and so if you wanna do something uh, beyond, you know, construction oriented kind of thing, that might be something your HOA would want to budget for, and it, you and know, putting again, in a bridge or something. Again, with with the open spaces being privately held, those are the responsibility of the owners' associations, ultimately at the, the cost HOA. of the owner. Okay. The trails, if they're public trails, would be maintained by the city. Very good, very good. That's all from me, sir. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next. is um, Paula Bird. I live in Prescott Valley and I'm wondering the access to the public trails that you're talking about there'll be will there be parking because much of the area like in 1A there's no parking on the street so how would people who live outside of that neighborhood get access to the public trails? Generally speaking we would not have um, parking areas designated those would be something that the city would be responsible for um, typically, even if it's a public trail system, it provides connectivity. You start somewhere else and you walk through. You don't drive here to get on the trail system. So I don't anticipate any um, public parking being provided other than street parking where it's allowed. So will there be street parking allowed within that neighborhood? Unless there's some unusual circumstances, yes. Because they're like in phase one, um, I don't know exactly where it is, but there's a lot of no parking signs on there. So there's, and there's like an area that's a quite an open area that looks like would be good for parking um, so that you could connect to the P-Line trail um, lower down than up at the no. uh, public there parking by 89A, but it all has no parking signs all the way around. Well, the there there's a, so the P-Line parking lot on the north there right off of 89A and side road is really right. the public parking and that's just a, a hop, skip and a jump to to get down here, but th therein lies a thing yeah. like it, when I made the statement that 98% of people that walk who are really from the, or you know, use the trails or from that subdivision, that's one way you control, you make it public, there's advantages of being public because it gets maintained and built, but then you don't put a lot of parking in there so that you don't really have, you're not soliciting people in to, you know, be in the trails all the time, but there is sure. you can get to it like George says from other other parking areas. But but, but we don't use no parking to keep people out. Generally, no mm. parking signs are because it's there's some potential traffic impairment or danger. Curves, um, narrower streets will have no parking on one side, or or in some cases if they're narrow enough on both sides, or if they're arterial or collector roads, they may have no parking. I, I guess I would just suggest that if they, if they are truly public trails, having more, because the parking lot you're talking about is actually about a mile from where this is, so you have to walk for a, a mile through not the, the prettiest part of the Peavine Trail to get down to this area where it, it does become much more attractive. So having some, some public access either on the street parking or, or for other people besides people who just live in this neighborhood would make it a little more truly public um, trails. So. Thank you. Thank you. 
wanted to add one thing the gentleman in the back brought up about, you know, who will pay for this or, or who's involved. One of the reasons Prescott is so successful with trails and uh, outdoor recreation is because we're in one of the most collaborative communities I've ever been in. And that's really the key. Two keys for successful grant proposals are planning and collaboration. And thanks to people like George and other people and Ken's wife, we, we have really rocked it here with uh, developers and with uh, key uh, uh, other agencies in collaborative process. And again, we're now nationally recognized as one of the top in the country because of that. Uh, oh, did that answer? Okay, other members of the public? I mean, you can come and not, you know, not talk, but we, we encourage as many of the public to come up and throw in your comments, you know, and whether you're in opposition or whether you're, for, you know, you think this is a good plan, you know, whatever you want to voice your opinion on is welcome. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> yeah, it's always good to walk. Thank you. Uh, living in Arizona, we have one major uh, product that's available that has really endeared the growth of our community, and that is water. Water to me is very important. Without it, I can't survive. Have the plans been re-updated or should be updated to incorporate the 100-year provision in there mm -hmm. to be able to support the all of these buildings and communities that are going up. This is not the only one. There's another big one over on uh, Glassford Hill Road. There are several more in the area that are going like gangbusters. I realize we, we also get water from the big Chino Aquifer. Sooner or later, we're gonna run out of water. Yeah. Well, you know, George I can answer this, but I mean, before this subdivision was even started to build, they had to go work through the process, which is the first process that the city has. You, they don't even come in for platting or anything until they come in and verify that and prove that there's a 100-year water supply. But I don't know if, George, you want to say some more about that? Yes. So when, when the original master plan was, was done and when the annexation of the area for development was done, a, a water allocation was determined for that development. Uh, the city maintains a water budget. We keep very close track of how much water is available to allocate for development. This was one that was done more than 10 years ago. They're maintaining the same number of lots, so they're not using any additional water. And one interesting thing that came out of some recent studies is we're finding that as development proceeds and as technology improves that individually lots are using far less water than we allocate for them. We assumed they used more at the time. So I would say in this particular case, while they're keeping the same number of lots um, and maybe just contracting the development slightly westward, um, the water usage overall is probably reduced significantly over what was originally anticipated. As far as other developments in the area, the same process is used for any of them within Prescott. Uh, we don't have control over the development east of Granite Dells Estates, that's Prescott Valley. Um, within Prescott, we go through that same accounting process. The city council pays very close attention to how they spend their water because it's more valuable than money. You're right. Thanks, gentlemen. Yeah. We appreciate it. Yeah, in, in this particular case here, they're on a closed-loop closed system with the water and the sewer system. So about 60% of the water goes back into the sewer system and charges the aquifer. So it, it, it uses far less that way too. Yes, John. Mr. Chairman, can I just point out to the gentleman and, and everybody that over the next eight or so council meetings, um, including the one we just had, the study sessions, there will be some major presentations about city water, city water resources, new policies, code changes, um, that address that should address based on data and analysis by a couple of experts mm -hmm. should address people's water concerns so I would encourage anybody who's interested or concerned about the city the city city of Prescott's water resources as well as the AMA as a whole to uh, go to those meet go to those study sessions they'll be publicly noticed 
um, to or, or to watch it on TV or to watch it on the internet, you know, Facebook or the city website, because it will really it, 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 it there's some real really significant um, new information and new data that's that's being presented and that has been presented at city council meetings over the last couple of months. So I would encourage anybody who has that interest in in the city's water supply and the AMA to attend those meetings to watch those things because it will it, it, it's, it's some really new great information really good news um, but but certainly if you're interested in that issue please go to go keep your eye out for the council study sessions and that will be discussed over the next two or three months um, getting into some real detail at some levels but and big picture at others but that's that would be yeah. my suggestion okay. thank you and you you're John Palladini yes, I am. yes the city attorney so he doesn't have to identify everybody knows him everyone knows mr paladini but that is really good information and i encourage you as well to pay attention to yeah. uh, are we guys. any more in the public here while we're on the public anymore in the public want to speak okay i'll i'll go ahead and close the public hearing uh george do you have anything else you want to I just uh, mostly for uh, the public to know what we're doing uh, you have a staff report um we have a motion on the back page of the staff report, but the front page of the staff report with this list of one through four is a little bit better explanation. And you probably, if you choose to proceed today, um, make your motions from that front page. Yeah, it's, yeah, the, you know, the, this front page here, and I don't know that you would need to read the entire statement, but as long as you have the, the actual code number in front and just say what that is, a general plan amendment or a master plan amendment, okay. Is the public hearings closed? Any more discussion of the commissioners? No. I, I want to look at that unsubdivided track again. Uh, am I understanding that we've taken the water allocation that was for that parcel and put it on the other 850 acres? It's compressed Transfer. over just like the lots are. There's a water allocation for each lot. They are so moving th them so all west. There is no water allocation if this passes for this unsubdivided track. That would be correct. Any future development would have to go through the full process, come in, request water, request a plat, uh, just like um, this original uh, subdivision did uh -huh. 10 years ago. I understand. Okay. Well, I know I, I sat through some of the presentations on the water and th the things John Palladini was mentioning is that there may be a process change that's gonna help streamline that. Yeah, Jim, Jim's on the water committee here. Commissioners, <clears throat> share with you that um, the Water Issues Committee deals with the water, and we have water. The Planning and Zoning Commission deals with land use, and does this comply with our general plan, and is it in the best interest of using the land in this capacity uh, within the city of Prescott? So from that perspective, uh, we work diligently with the legal department on water, and since I know you guys are very, very cognizant also of the concerns of the community, et cetera, over water, we have gone to the extent of having, as John was explaining to you, some, some uh, very notable water experts come up and explain. At one time, many years ago, we used a 0.33 acre foot of water per unit. Now we're down to a 0.17. Well, the demographic of the community has changed. The folks that are moving here aren't the people that have four and five kids anymore who we have coming here a majority of the time are 55 years and older. So they have a lot more concern over different things and a lot less relevance to using water that's been treated for arsenic at a particular cost of putting it on the dirt for green grass. So to share with you, does, does this type of development for land use make sense in the city? That's what I would share with you. Yeah, yeah and the, I know that from the previous phases, this Granite Dells Estates has done wa water smart type landscaping. Of course, all the building codes require the water smart houses and, and of course the homes themselves, in order to market them, they wanna be water, you know, use minimal water and minimal electricity and all that kind of thing. So they're, this, this subdivision is developing under recommended type guidelines that are regarding minimal landscaping and, and uh, what s the plants they use select and things. So. They're doing a good job up there from what, what we've all seen. Okay, any other discussion among the commissioners? 
I have a question and maybe a recommendation, and that is, as we begin a process like this, where it is a significant parcel, I would like to see more of an overlay so that we can see things like the Peavine Trail, the Iron King Trail, where it goes to Glassford, so that uh, the commissioners and all of the applicants and the people that are here have a very clear understanding that we're all on the same page. And I'm, I'm just asking if that can be done that way because it would be helpful. I'm sure that I know you've got them because you and I have talked about them, but it would be very helpful. <laughs> so be very so helpful to go over them to start. So something like this that sort of gives an aerial um, showing nearby properties, but includes some additional information. Yeah, like okay. Where the trails are. And right. And, and we can easily do that. I mean, the, the Peavine Trail runs across here. The Iron King Trail is down here. Runs like that. So there, there are things that we yeah, can show yeah. you. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm saying it's down here. Yeah. It'd be very helpful if it were delineated. Because we can, we can provide you simple. some. A, a picture is worth a thousand words. We will provide you with a little bit bigger picture of, of those things. Actually, I, I agree with George. That sometimes it, you, you sit here and you look at a project because it's the project you've got to deal with, but you don't know how it always fits into the to the rest of the city, mm -hmm. especially nearby it. No, you, we're, we're working with a parcel here that's on the borderline. It's not like it's in the middle of the city, so we already know. Correct. And there's so much going on out here. It would be handy to have that. I think the public might even get a better sense of what's we'll happening. We will give you better vicinity maps in the future. Yeah. Of course, it's mostly, I think, live out in that vicinity, and you pretty much, you guys pretty much know what's going on out there where, where you are. But I would like to say that I'm, I'm really impressed <laughs> with what, uh, what they've done here with uh, line engineering and fan contracting and what, uh, Mike Fan, the owner, to take uh, this 1,100 acres and take it down to 850-ish or so and uh, reduce the density moderately and create so much more open space. I think it's pretty unusual to see that. Uh, I come from a background where I've seen these subdivision and master plan communities and the open space always shrinks. Uh, in this case, you got one that increased, so hallelujah. Kudos to you. I, I love this plan, I think it's great, even with this unsubdivided track question that could be out there. Um, I think it's a pretty nice uh, revision. Are we ready to act on this? I think we can make a motion. Okay, you want to do it? Well, there's four motions in this package. Yeah, we have to do them each vote separately. Is that correct, George? Yes, so four separate motions. So I move actions. to recommend the approval with conditions uh, proposed for master plan MPA 19-001. Do you have a second? Okay. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand, say aye. 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 Okay, next next motion. You want to do them? Okay, I move to recommend with uh, modifications of the ordinance for the proposed zoning map amendment PLN 19 001. Oops. Zero, zero one one, just for clarity. Yep, all in favor, raise your right hand. Aye. Say aye. aye. Okay, passes five, five to zero. Okay, next. We're on a roll. Uh, I move to recommend, recommend adoption with modifications of the ordinance for the proposed general plan amendment GNP 19-001. Uh, George, okay. All in favor, raise your right hand, say aye. Okay. Aye. Five to zero. Okay. The last one, I believe. I move to recommend the approval with conditions of proposed preliminary plat PLN 19-016. A second. Okay. Yeah, okay. All in favor, raise your right hand. Say aye. Okay, George, is there any uh, announcements or further business you would like to bring up? Brand, why don't you tell us what's going on? You're the community development director you must know all kinds of things all kinds of things good morning commissioners and mr. chair Bryn Stotler director of community development um, one update of significance um, addressing building activities within our community the City Council 
uh, voted to adopt the 2018 ICC Building and Technical Codes at its Tuesday meeting. So um, that was done as a part of a collaboration across jurisdictions, City of Prescott, Prescott Valley, Chino Valley, and Yavapai County. So our contracting community now has um, one sheet of music, so to speak, to work off of um, as they build across our jurisdictions. And um, uh, one other item of note is that uh, in town this week is the Arizona State Historical Preservation Conference. And our Historic Pre Preservation Coordinator, Kat Moody, is heavily involved. She's on the board um, and the organizing committee for that conference. And um, they have a lot of activities going on in the downtown area. You may see folks doing walking tours and um, events at the Holiday Courtyard and so forth. So it's uh, quite a lovely event, brings about 400 people from across the state to our community uh, to enjoy this beautiful time of year and also to uh, celebrate historic preservation in our state. So um, if, if you weren't aware of that, um, we, we may, may have been an remiss in, in providing details ahead of it, but um, it's a great event and we're glad to have it here. So. Th doesn't Prescott have something like seven or 800 his registered uh, structures on the national and or state? Yeah. More, more than Phoenix, yeah. the planning manager tells me. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, territorial capital. Yeah. Who'd have thunk? Okay. That's, that's all I have today. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, we're adjourned. Thank you, for everybody, for coming.